I'm Rich Lund, and welcome to another episode of Indie Labs, where we put the science in your hands. Today is Albert Einstein's birthday, so I thought what better way to celebrate that than to do an experiment that I think he'd love. Using some classic techniques, we are going to measure the speed of light. Well, classic ever since the microwave oven made it onto shelves and into the physics classroom. Like many technologies, the very first microwaves were pretty large and expensive. As technology got better, they got smaller and eventually became commercially available. That happened in 1955. And that's the same year that Einstein passed. He just missed this one. So let's honor the man and celebrate his birthday right. Let's do something he'd really appreciate. I mean, think about it. The speed of light. During his time period, scientists were really trying to figure out clever ways to measure it. And now, you can do it at home with a home appliance. That's awesome. Let's talk about materials. For our lab today, you're gonna need plenty of chocolate, preferably and specifically the flat bar kind. You want plenty of flat surface to do this, so if you're gonna use just the regular ones, I'd get at least four. With this kind of lab, the more chocolate, the better. When is that last sentence ever not true? Probably if there's a chocolate allergy. But you can use white chocolate for this too. If you haven't picked up on it yet, you're gonna need a microwave oven. My wife loves it when we use the microwave oven for labs because it ensures that it gets clean. Except, of course, for the inside top, which the camera never sees. I'm just kidding. I clean the top of it. I clean the inside top. I... I do. I do! You will need some type of microwave-safe dish or plate or tray, like I'm using here. Can you even buy unsafe ones these days? I never see them at the store. Warning! This plate should not be placed in a microwave. I don't see that. I don't, I've never seen that warning label. You'll need some toothpicks, and you'll need a ruler. Hey. Be kind to yourself. Use metric. It makes your life easier. And finally, you're going to need a calculator. There's going to be some math involved with this, and I'll walk you through it. Now, before we get into it, it definitely helps to understand how a microwave actually works. So, let's check that out. Microwave ovens get their name from the fact that they produce microwaves, a type of electromagnetic radiation, which is a form of light. It's just a type of light that we can't see. But they do travel at the speed of light, just like any other type of light does. Inside of the microwave, they act as standing waves, which as you can see here from the model, it's kind of like a jump rope. It oscillates up and down, but it's not so much traveling left to right. As it oscillates, those maximum areas of oscillation, well that's where the microwave intensity is the most. The minimum places are where it's the least. Those points of minimum fluctuation, by the way, are called nodes, and the points of maximum fluctuation are called antinodes. And so as you heat up food in there, the maximum areas are going to receive more heat energy. Water is excellent at absorbing microwave radiation. That's why we use the frequencies that we do for microwaves. It's perfect for water to absorb. And as you heat up water, it's going to heat unevenly if it's not on one of those rotating platforms. They incorporated the rotators so that way we could heat our food a little bit more evenly. Now if we put some chocolate in there, we can do the same thing. Don't let it rotate, and as it's standing still, the maximum areas of oscillation are going to heat the chocolate earlier than the rest. It's going to heat unevenly. And where the chocolate first starts to melt, that's where we're going to have an indicator as to where those maximum oscillations are. We can turn off the microwave and check it afterwards and see where those points were. That will correspond to a peak in a trough where the wavelength was, and so this will be half a complete wavelength. We can use the chocolate to measure the full wavelength. take our chocolate and we lay it flat in a microwave of known frequency and we don't allow the chocolate to rotate, it's stationary, then our chocolate will be heated by the standing microwaves and it'll be heated unevenly. The places where it's going to heat the most will be at the crests and troughs of the standing waves, the antinodes. Because it's heating unevenly, the places where it first starts to melt is going to then reveal to us where the antinodes are. Two antinodes that are close to each other are going to be half a wavelength. We will be able to use that to measure the actual wavelength of our microwave, and with the frequency and the wavelength, we will be able to calculate the speed of light. And since this is a hypothesis, I'm going to also have to make it something that is testable. It's either going to be supported or disproven by this experiment. So I'm going to say that we're going to be able to measure the speed of light within 10%. No, 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 no. Within 5% of the accepted value. Albert Einstein would have wanted it that way. 
Go big or go home. If you have a rotating microwave, you'll need to remove the plate and the ring that causes the food to rotate. And also because of the part that actually causes the rotation, we'll have to cover that up. So I'm just going to use the same plate but placed on there upside down. Now our microwave is prepped. Get your toothpicks and unwrap your chocolate. Place the chocolate side where the smooth side is facing up. Place as much of your chocolate as will fit comfortably onto your plate or into your tray. You want a good amount of surface area on the top. Then we'll pop it into the microwave and start to heat it. Notice I've got a plate in there to keep everything flat. Every microwave is a little bit different, so I'm going to try mine for just 30 seconds here at first. You want to monitor it closely, make sure that it doesn't start over melting. After 30 seconds, I take a peek and no, we don't have any melting yet. So we'll pop it in for a little bit longer. After about 15 seconds, I took another check and yes, I did see some melting, but just not enough to take any measurements. So we'll go another 15 seconds. Once it's finished, take a look and yes, I do see some melted spots. So we're ready to take it out of there. Here are the areas where the chocolate first started to melt. So that's indicating to us where the anti-nodes are. So we're going to take our toothpicks now and try to find as close as you can the center of where these melted spots is located. You might need to hold your toothpick there for a little bit. Let the chocolate take hold. Be careful while you do this to make sure the toothpick is as straight up and down as you can get it. Once your toothpicks are in place, you're going to need to let your chocolate sit and cool for a while and solidify. While you do that, you've got another mission. Find your frequency of your microwave. Should be labeled somewhere, often on the inside door. And ours here is 2450 megahertz. We also need those wavelengths to be measured, so once our chocolate is cool, we're going to get a ruler. And again, please use metric. Centimeters makes this so much easier. When measuring distance with your ruler, if your lines measure out to the tenths of a centimeter like mine do, you're allowed to estimate the next decimal place over. Since this looks to me to be right on the 6.4 centimeter line, I can call this 6.40 centimeters. And because I have two other melted spots on my chocolate, I can take a second measurement and we'll just average these together. This one looks to be between 6.2 and 6.3, so I'm going to call it 6.25 centimeters. Now with those lengths and with our frequency, we can calculate the speed of light. Okay, moment we've been waiting for. Time for the analysis. In my experiment, I came up with two measurements for the half wavelength of my microwave. So I'm going to want to take an average of these to find an average half wavelength. You know how to take an average, right? Add up your measurements together and then divide it by the number of measurements that you have. In my case, it was just two. And so I get an average half wavelength. But I want to get a full wavelength. So I'm going to take this average half wavelength and I'm going to multiply it by two to get the average wavelength of my microwaves. Now that's in centimeters. For this calculation to work, I'm going to need to put that into meters. There's 100 centimeters in a meter, so to convert your wavelength measurement from centimeters to meters, you need to divide it by 100. Or, in other words, just move the decimal place two spots to the left. You can see that the wavelength for my microwaves is 0 0.1265 meters. Next part, the frequency. The frequency reported on my microwave was in megahertz. Now, one megahertz means a million hertz. So we can convert our megahertz reading to hertz by multiplying it by a million. So add six zeros to it. You'll see that mine is 2,450,000,000 hertz. Now a little detail to take care of also is what the unit hertz means. One hertz is one cycle per second, how many times something happens each second. So we can actually swap out the unit of hertz with the unit of per seconds. Why we're doing this will make more sense once you see the calculation. The speed of any wave is its wavelength multiplied by its frequency. And so we can take the wavelength of our microwave light and multiply it by the frequency of our microwave light and get a speed of light. So here's our wave speed equation. And we can swap out the words with the symbols lambda and nu, which is what we use to symbolize wavelength and frequency in physics equations. When I plug in my values, I get for the speed of light 309,925,000 meters per second. So how does that compare to the real speed of light that we know? The speed of light, C, is 299,792,458 meters per second. But that's the speed of light in a vacuum. Our microwave was not in a vacuum. Our microwaves have air in them, so we have to actually take into account what the speed of light is in air. When light passes through a medium, that medium can slow it down a little bit. 
Any material that can let light pass through it has an index of refraction. You can take this value and divide it into the speed of light to find out how fast light goes through that medium. When we do this for air, we find that the speed of light through air is slightly slower. 299,702,547.2 meters per second. Now if you're doing this experiment at home with me, then you can use that value too. Provided, of course, your microwave was in air, not underwater. Why, why did you have a microwave plugged in underwater? Anyway, don't, don't do that. That's, that's dangerous. So that value represents our accepted value of the speed of light through air. And here's the value that I found through my experiment. I propose in doing this experiment that I would get less than 5% error in my measurement. So let's see if I got 5% or less. To calculate the percent error, we're going to subtract the experimental value from the accepted value. And then we're going to take the absolute value of that, divide that by the accepted value, and then multiply it by 100 to turn it into a percentage. Whenever we're finding a percent error, we don't really care if you were above or below the accepted value. We just care how much away from it you were. So that's why we take the absolute value of this. That just means you take the negative number and you're going to turn it into a positive number. When you plug in my values to this equation, and you can feel free to double check my math, my percent error winds up being, moment of truth, 3.41%, less than 5%, hypothesis supported, definitely good work for a microwave and some bars of chocolate. Happy birthday, Einstein. Hey, now that you've finished the experiment, don't forget, dispose of your chocolate any way that you feel is appropriate. Did you try out this lab? I really want to hear about your results. So after you do it, make sure to come back, post a comment below, let us know about your percent error, even if it's really bad. Hey, that happens. Take some photos of your chocolatey results. Put them on Twitter and Instagram. Hashtag Indie Labs so we can all find them. And do you have a scientific concept that you'd like to see an episode of Indie Labs explore? In the comments below, let me know a topic that you'd like to see an episode try to flesh out for you, and we'll see what we can do. I'm gonna try to fulfill some requests here in 2016. If you enjoyed doing this and want to see more, check out some of the previous Indie Labs and be sure to subscribe to the channel. More coming out all the time. And happy birthday, Einstein. I'd like to leave you all with my favorite quote from the man, which I've personally found quite inspiring. The important thing is not to stop questioning. Curiosity has its own reason for existence. Thanks for checking it out. I'm Rich Lund, and I will see you next time.